So these are my disclosures. And I note that I will uh, talk about off-label use of medications, but those are uh, uh, described and recommended as alternative drugs by current AASLD, uh, easel, and I should add even apostle practice guidelines. As you know, uh, 2019 through 2021 were banner years for the publications of the writing committee of AASLD on an update of its guidance uh, and guidelines, as well as the publication of the systematic reviews and meta-analyses that led to the recommendations. And I was very privileged to be part of that uh, writing group, which is depicted in the, the photo at ASLD headquarters below. All of you know that the natural history of autoimmune hepatitis is a progressive disease if it's untreated or only partially treated. And it's that issue of partial treatment or non-responsive treatment that I want to focus our attention on today. Now, you're all aware of the continuation of this uh, disease through its fibrotic stages, ultimately to cirrhosis. I call attention on this uh, slide that at the time of diagnosis, we still all too often find advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. This probably has uh, two uh, origins. Uh, the first is failure to recognize the importance of sustained elevations of amino transferases and not actually go through a diagnostic algorithm. But the other is that uh, clinically, it is an insidious disease process with a paucity of symptoms that may allow a patient to actually progress for decades before they seek medical attention. But once they do and we establish the diagnosis, our obligation obviously uh, is to treat it. Now, even if we treat it and are close to a remission criterion, I show this slide to emphasize that on all of the SF36 domains of quality of life, patients with autoimmune hepatitis score worse than controls. This is an impactful disease, and it all impacts the principle that inflammation has systemic consequences. So systemic inflammation of the liver in this case has sustained consequences that the patient struggles with virtually lifelong unless we can eliminate that inflammation. Now you're equally aware that we have uh, excellent evidence basis for recommending three ways to induce the remission. One, a combination of prednisone and azathioprine. Another for non-serotics of budesonide and azathioprine. And then finally, uh, a prednisone monotherapy to be followed usually by the fourth to sixth week with the addition of azathioprine so as a steroid sparing regimen. Now, of course, this slide shows that the person responds, and we're going to talk about what that actually entails in a moment, and that we maintain them. We try to taper to the lowest possible doses of immunosuppression to avoid side effects. They enter remission. Uh, and then we have the issue of whether prolonged remission makes them eligible uh, for slow withdrawal of, uh, of immunosuppression and pot potentially to be fully withdrawn uh, for immunosuppre of immunosuppression. So this is what we always hope to achieve, but the reality isn't always that. So what is remission? Well, we have still been, unfortunately, worldwide uh, um, at the mercy of a failure to grasp the more modern definitions and a desire to say that if we merely reduce the AST and ALT levels to one and a half to two times the upper limit of normal, that we have done well enough. And that clearly is not true. And we know that the 2002 definition shown here from the AASLD guidelines is quite different from that of the 2010 AASLD guideline, which was reiterated by the EASL guidelines in 2015, and also by our more recent publication in 2019 from AASLD. So we are looking for a deep normalization of ALT as the first evidence of biochemical response. We are also looking for normalization of IG. And we're histologic uh, elimination of the portal lymphoplasmic inflammation and interface hepatitis, not just a reduction in inflammation. Now, what's the consequence uh, uh, and why do we say that? 
Well, we know on the left, you see from the Dalwell uh, study that the survival is related to residual inflammation. So we don't want inflammation in the liver. It is a worthy uh, a goal to eliminate it. And you can see the difference between a, a, a histologic activity score of less than or equal to three versus that of four or greater. On the right, you can see that progression to cirrhosis using the 2002 AASLD definition of remission of one and a half to two times the upper limit of, of normal enzymes constituting remission resulted in about 65% of patients progressing uh, to cirrhosis uh, over time. So anything that uh, has a pre-cirrhotic uh, histology that on therapy progresses to cirrhosis, I would argue is not a, a, a good therapy, nor is the definition of remission appropriate. We know that in 2010, after the publication of the initial guidance of the stringent definition of remission, that the Muratoris in Northern Italy retrospectively looked at their very large population of patients treated with steroid and azathioprine. They found that if they looked and applied the AASLD 2002 guideline, that they had progression during so-called remission in about half of their patients, 46%. They looked at the group that had a deep sustained normalization of ALT and IgG, and they found instead that there was progression in only one patient, that's the 4% uh, shown here. This in other studies uh, have uh, validated the, the uh, clinical utility of achieving normalization of ALT and IgG as the biochemical evidence of remission. This slide is probably not necessary to a sophisticated audience like you, but we also deal with a number of patients who seek our advice as well as physicians <clears throat> who seek our advice. And the underlying message here is that cirrhotic patients should be treated. Unfortunately, some clinicians believe that all we are trying to treat uh, for is uh, to uh, prevent progression to cirrhosis. And therefore, if they're already cirrhotic, there's no need to treat. Nothing could be further from the truth because cirrhotic patients can respond and we all know that we can then stop the progression of cirrhosis to clinically significant portal hypertensive complications and the need for transplantation. Now, it's also true that autoimmune hepatitis was the first disease in which it was proven that cirrhosis could be downstaged. And this classic presentation uh, from Al Shia uh, to the left uh, shows that over four to 12 years of therapy, the resolution of histologic cirrhosis. We also know that that can be monitored effectively by using transient elastography. Now, whether that happens to be a device like a Sonocyte uh, uh, a device, an echo sense device, or you were actually going to use magnetic resonance uh, elastography, it really is probably all the same. But this particular study looked at a fiber scan, the echo sense transit elastography uh, in Germany. And they found that uh, over time, that those that had biochemical remission shown in the top right uh, had a reduction in liver stiffness. Those that did not had an increase in liver stiffness. Now they also showed that liver stiffness by transient elastography is, as we know, fibroinflammatory stiffness. Therefore, you, one had to get rid of substantial amounts of inflammation within the liver while on therapy in order to have liver stiffness residuum that was indeed indicative of only fibrosis and not inflammation. And that's why they pointed out that you really want to, uh, to watch this and not overstage your patient at, at the time of diagnosis. After they achieve biochemical remission, you really want to look at liver stiffness to determine that. But it gives you a way to follow patients, which is encouraging to patients because they don't wish to undergo repetitive biopsies. Now, how are we doing in sophisticated uh, centers? I'm gonna show you two uh, sets of data from the UK. Uh, this is from uh, Dyson. And I wanna call your attention that in red, we have those that are in remission. 
and in blue, those not in remission. Now, I want to focus on the left-hand side, where we're looking at patients that are on monotherapy with a thiopurine. It's most often azathioprine, but it would be 6-MP. A thiopurine plus uh, prednisolone, corticosteroid only, or no immunosuppression. And I think you can look at that and get an average sense that somewhere around 40%, near 40%, are not in remission, even though they are being followed by consultants that are knowledgeable within a national health system and have access to the therapies, we have still about 40% that are not in remission. Now, if you look to the right, these tend to be your more problematic patients that we want to focus attention on that didn't you know, get even close uh, to a remission. They've been treated by a variety of things. And I think it, it becomes anecdotal to look at those in, in detail. But again, we do not have a, a good proportion of patients in remission. So what I want to emphasize here is, is everyone has said for the last 20 years that if you treat with steroid and azathioprine, you're going to have 80 to 90% remission. These data countermand that statement because that remission criterion was that of the 2002 guidance. And it's really not that. Now, here's the other set of data. This comes from Dave Jones. We looked at the UK Autoimmune Hepatitis Registry. It's nearly, it's about 1,480 patients or so. I rounded it to 1,500, but it's about a quarter of all UK AIH patients in the database. And 41% were not in remission based on the stringent criteria. So again, I think that it's, it's fair to say that somewhere uh, between you know, uh, 30 and 40% of uh, patients on average may have difficulty achieving remission. So I want to now turn to our approach to such a patient where they, they have partial or non-response to standard of care steroids. Now I wanna broaden our discussion in, our, in thinking about this problem that we want to look at azathioprine, thiopurine or 6-MP uh, thiopurine, uh, you know, a product of the prodrug azathioprine, or even MMF, and cluster them as anti-proliferatives. So I want us to be thinking anti-proliferative because there's a great tendency around the world to have patients uh, treated uh, just uh, empirically by physicians with MMF instead of ever being treated with azathioprine or 6-MP. So I'd like us to think about the fact that an anti-proliferative has been in this equation. So the first thing that we wanna ask of such a patient is the patient responding clinically and biochemically as expected. And I show this very old set of graphs from Al Chaya's work at the Mayo Clinic showing that biochemical remission, symptomatic remission obviously is, is accelerated, but biochemical remission shown in the turquoise uh, blue is also relatively rapid. Now, it still is going to be plateauing between six and 12 months, but the, the issue is, are you on the right track? Are you having sustained, continuous reductions in AST and ALT? And if you are, you probably want to see it through and emphasize for the patient access to their medications if, if, uh, and uh, adherence to the regimen. Now, key question number two of such a patient is, AIH, the correct diagnosis. And there, we can easily go back in our records, review the International Autoimmune Hepatitis Group score, and there I would use the revised diagnostic criteria because they're more robust than the simplified, and just assure yourself that uh, they met those criteria, and then think of comorbid causes of them having an increased ALT or AST, principally DILI, I'll talk more specifically later about the other. But I also want everyone to consider the potential of HEV infection. Because the hepatitis E viral infection, if it is occurring in an immunosuppressed patient on therapy, uh, can be very difficult to uh, ascertain, including the fact that if they were heavily immunosuppressed at the time of infection, they may not make uh, diagnostic antibodies. Therefore, you really want to look for this using PCR to detect viremia. And that is very uh, uh, gratifying because it's treatable. 
And then finally is the issue of Wilson disease. Have we missed Wilson disease? Uh, because it can be an absolute mimic of a classic autoimmune hepatitis uh, with type one uh, autoantibodies. And here you have the advantage that the diagnosis of AIH includes the requirement of a liver biopsy. So you have a paraffin block somewhere that has a core in which you could do quantitative copper if you couldn't do any other testing on the patient. But keep in mind, ceruloplasmin can indeed be normal or even supernormal in a, a patient presenting uh, with a, a Wilson disease mimic of AIH. So what is our third question? Is the patient intolerant of steroids or azathioprine, 6MP or MMF, the antiproliferatives? And there, uh, patients complain of a variety of things, but you really want to dig into the history for signs or symptoms of AEs, and in particular for the antiproliferatives, laboratory evidence of cytopenias that mean that you need an alternative therapy, and that this is not a long-term uh, success strategy to continue antiproliferatives. Question number four, is the patient adherent to your immunosuppressive drug regimen? Well, there's history is key here, and the doctor-patient relationship and rapport is key because a patient uh, would be uh, most prone to be embarrassed by admitting that they're not taking their drugs uh, as prescribed or that they haven't refilled prescriptions. And that gets you to the point where if you are suspecting that there is a problem, uh, at least uh, in the United States and certainly in uh, the national uh, healthcare systems, you can look at uh, pharmacy refill records. I mean, are they actually taking their drugs and, and refilling their prescriptions? But finally, for the antiproliferatives, at least of the thiopurine class, thiopurine methyl transferase uh, testing for absent or low levels of 6-MP metabolites, especially the 6-MEMPN and 6 thioguanine nucleotides, which showed at the bottom of the little diagram of metabolism, are your immunosuppressive metabolites. If they're absent or low, then you have pause that your patient may not uh, be taking uh, their medications as prescribed. The question five then becomes, is the patient on optimal doses? And if not, and you're unsure, you can consider in selected patients a steroid recycle so that you basically attempt a greater uh, immunosuppression over a relatively short period of time of four weeks, and that you thereafter optimize the ASA at 6MP based on the levels of metabolites so that you can measure the actual uh, metabolic product that you're seeking as an immunosuppressive. Or you can assess the need to block conversion of azathioprine and 6-MP to inactive 6-thiouridine uh, with allopurinol. And that is illustrated on this uh, slide where one sees that the 6-MP, either given alone or generated uh, in the liver uh, from the prodrug azathioprine, is preferentially being uh, uh, sent to 6-thiouridine uh, under uh, the uh, xanthine oxidase uh, mechanism. And if, if that does occur, obviously downstream metabolites such as the 6-MEMPNs and the 6-thioguanine nucleotides uh, are reduced. There's, there's no substrate for them to be produced in adequate quantities. De Boyer here uh, showed uh, in a series of uh, patients in these spaghetti graphs that when xanthine oxidase was blocked simply with 100 milligrams daily allopurinol, that there was a substantial increase in 6 thioguanine nucleotides in all but one patient and a reduction in the non-immunosuppressive uh, metabolites. And the consequence uh, was that over one, three, and six months as shown on the right panel, these patients that had abnormal ALTs reached normalization in uh, some individuals. Now, whether they would have uh, had that sustained when we get out to a year or so, we do not know, but I think it is an illustration that some patients may require blocking xanthine oxidase to achieve adequate immunosuppression 
the thiopurines. Now, I mentioned before I was going to loop back to other kinds of comorbid conditions, and this one looms large for uh, everyone in uh, developed nations, and that is, is the persistent abnormal ALT in a patient you're treating for autoimmune hepatitis actually due to comorbid non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And there's many studies I can show. I'm just showing uh, one of the originals of this, the DeLuca Johnson uh, study uh, from the US. And uh, this showed, as you see at the, at the bottom, that out of their patients, uh, which were 73 in the study cohort, uh, they uh, studied them and biopsied them again and found 51 uh, or 70 percent had AIH alone, uh, leaving 30 percent that had comorbid uh, NAFL. And we had uh, evidence uh, that uh, 12 of the 73 or 16 percent, about half of those that had NAFL, uh, had evidence of actual uh, NASH. And that in that particular group, there was an increased frequency of cirrhosis, although a much larger study would needed to be done to, to, uh, to look at cause and effect there. But it does illustrate uh, the fact that comorbid NAFL will probably be a stalking horse for us in a uh, befuddlement of uh, our assessment of remission based on ALT levels. And the hope is that we are going to have more sophisticated biomarkers for actually the autoimmune disease itself, autoimmune hepatitis, as opposed to other forms of autoimmune injury, that is the holy grail. And if we were to have that, and it was based on a quantitative uh, uh, metabolite or, or metabolic process that we might be able to discern the difference in the origin of enzymes with NAFL. Correspondingly, if we get biomarkers that are highly specific for NAFL and liver injury, that may also suffice uh, to eliminate uh, the problem that we have. At the moment, I think the only recourse we have is to consider the, me the metabolic syndrome risk factors and when appropriate, biopsy the patient uh, to see whether you have lost the plasma lymphoplasmacytic infiltrates and interface hepatitis and what you have as a residuum is only a NAFL or NASH. So now we have the issue that not everyone responds to standard of care steroid plus or minus thiopurine. And we're back to our original diagram with the inductions. And here we have those that are intolerant uh, uh, as a reason that they're not responding. We have those that have a partial biochemical response, meaning they have a reduction, substantial reduction in AST and ALT, but they do not achieve normalization. And we have those that have very little reduction, which I'm characterizing as non-response. And then I've already talked about everything right beneath it in this algorithm in uh, some detail. And if we have, therefore, a confirmed failure to achieve remission, we have other potential ways to treat these patients. Unfortunately, all of those ways are essentially heavily empiric in choice and not evidence-based, as we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. So what about the choices of alternative immunosuppression for such patients? Well, what we published, and it was under uh, first authorship of Rodrigo Liberal from the International Autoimmune Hepatitis Group was the results of a survey. And it found that all those that were asked and this is a sophisticated group that is a mem membership of the International Autoimmune Hepatitis Group and really has a personal uh, interest in autoimmune hepatitis, that the first choice uh, drug as a total was MMF. And that was true in non-transplant as well as transplant centers. They just preferred a, a more modern antiproliferative as a trial and substituted for azathioprine. If you look at cyclosporin and dacrolimus as calcineurin inhibitors, you see that those totals were lessened and they were dominated by those uh, respondents that were in transplant centers, which is somewhat obvious because they're very familiar with the use of calcineurin inhibitors. And then you look at sirolimus, fliximab, rituximab, and there were very, very small numbers. 
So what we have to keep in mind if we choose to use MMF, and I mentioned earlier that many are choosing to use it as first line and not even using azathioprine or, or 6-MP first, is, is teratogenicity in a predominantly female population, particularly of childbearing potential. And that really is something that requires extraordinary counseling and appropriate monitoring. Uh, we really do not want unplanned pregnancies in this group because it's quite teratogenic. Its other side effects, as you all know, are relatively manageable. Now let's look at using MMF as a second line therapy. This comes from the large survey conducted and published by EFA. It was first published in abstract presented ASLB and then later in clinical gastroenterology and hepatology. They found 154 patients who could be subdivided as having intolerance to steroid thiopurines, partial response, or non-response as I've defined it before. And then when they were treated with MMF, the reported outcomes of obtaining normalization of ALT and IgG was that for the intolerant, 90% responded to MMF, which uh, is kind of in, in a way intuitive because all those that could have responded uh, didn't because they were intolerant of taking the drugs and they just couldn't to tolerate a, a course. Those that were partial response uh, had a 50% uh, uh, remission rate, but those that had non-response to an azathioprine or 6-MP regimen had only a 10% response. And I think that this is an important clinical principle that if you have not responded to an antiproliferative in the form of adequately dosed azathioprine and 6-MP at that, whose doses have been determined to be adequate by measuring thiopurine methyl transferase metabolites, then you're, you should not believe that switching them to MMF is going to have a major potential of achieving a remission. It just isn't. If you're not going to respond to uh, adequate doses of the former, you won't respond to the latter. And this slide depicts that. What about tacrolimus as second line uh, therapy? Well, among the calcineurin inhibitors, they had adequate data here, 100 patients to depict the same three groups, intolerant, partial responders, and non-responders. They did not have an adequate number. It was about 20 or so for uh, the cyclosporin. And so it wasn't really analyzed or reported, but it is uh, going to work through mechanisms, obviously similar to tucrolimus. And what you found was very much the same, that those that were intolerant had the highest responses, about 95%. Partial responses were close to 70% uh, uh, with tacrolimus, and it was about 48%, 47% for those that had non-response. So there was uh, significant evidence that a calcineurin inhibitor, an anti-T-cell proliferative, uh, was going to be effective in these patients. Now, this slide looks at the adverse events associated with the calcineurin inhibitors. And I've blocked in yellow there uh, the comparisons of importance, I think, in our modern era where we've already discussed metabolic syndrome and the risk of comorbid NAFL between TAC and cyclosporin. In particular is the issue of TAC being diabetogenic. And I think we have to be careful of that in the patients in, in, in whom we choose to use it. That is not true of cyclosporin. A teratogenicity in, in both of them is comparable. I have negative doesn't mean that it's impossible to have it. It's just that we know from transplantation and unplanned pregnancies that, uh, that uh, successful pregnancies uh, without deformities uh, can and, and generally do occur. So we just have to keep in mind that issue of diabetes. Now the hyperlipidemia is plus minus for TAC. It tends to be a hypertriglyceridemia for cyclosporin uh, patients. Uh, and again, we have ways to mitigate that. Now to the right is a little bit more sobering information, and that is that TAC has been used to achieve um, blood levels, so trough levels of between about four and 10 nanograms per ml, just what we would have for transplantation of solid organs. 
the unfortunate consequence uh, shown in the pink is that <clears throat> the population over time will have a rise in creatinine. And we know that in transplantation patients, uh, that rise uh, may ultimately lead to significant chronic kidney uh, disease and uh, even uh, a, a level five uh, requiring hemodialysis, which is not a good thing for a, a long-term therapy. So this raises the question about what are adequate uh, levels uh, that might protect the kidney for maintenance therapy, and it's never been adequately studied. And there are many other series than the one I'm showing you, but this one illustrates the point I want to make of the nephrotoxicity, as does the fact at the bottom in yellow, I pointed out that eight of the 17 patients ultimately discontinued. So again, it gives us pause when we think about calcineurin inhibitors for long term. Now I'm going to turn to what we did in preparation for recommendations of the 2019 AASLD guidelines. And that was to conduct uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses to answer the questions about uh, the suitability of uh, particular uh, therapies and their evidence basis. What we found that <clears throat> when you ask for a comparison between tacrolimus versus MMF as the choice of a second line therapy, that there were only two studies in the literature that were suitable for a meta-analysis. Uh, this is embarrassing, I think, to all of us as hepatologists that you know we're, we're 50 plus years uh, into uh, our assessment of autoimmune hepatitis and, and the quality of our studies and literature uh, remains poor. We had very low quality uh, studies to assess intolerance, death, or uh, frequency of OLT, and that we could make, therefore, only a conditional recommendation. Now, that was to favor MF over, uh, MMF over tacrolimus as initial uh, therapy, but I want to call to a sophisticated audience's attention that other evidence of TAC uh, superiority in non-responders exists, and you saw it. I showed you the EFA data. And part of the argument that went into this conditional favoritism for MMF was presumed ease of use and that it wouldn't frighten the non-transplant experienced gastroenterologist or hepatologist, excuse me. <clears throat> so I think that uh, either um, are, are used and uh, certainly uh, based on the fact that MMF is very poor in its response rate for non-responders, that tacrolimus would be the first line choice there. Now, what about other options? Uh, this is an illustration I created for that publication showing uh, complexity uh, in our modern knowledge about the immune response that's ultimately focusing effector mechanisms on hepatocytes. And to the right, not published in, in the journal, is a little bit of a, a portrayal, a cartoon of the pathology emphasizing that interface hepatitis is predominantly a cytotoxic T lymphocyte uh, CD8 uh, population event uh, that is killing uh, presumably on an antigen-specific basis and extending with through wound healing, scar emanating from the portal tract. Now, we won't go into any detail here, but you can see with the complexity comes several different phases if you move left to right, where we have opportunities to uh, interdict this, and that could use uh, new drugs. It could use therapies to uh, increase antigen-specific T regulatory cells, to decrease uh, the cytotoxic uh, cell population, or uh, render uh, them energic or with clonal energy, variety of things, and the literature will continue to evolve with that. What we have right now are empiric choices to the left of the lymphocyte proliferation inhibitors, the calcineurin uh, inhibition, then we have TNF-alpha inhibitors, mTOR inhibitors of interleukin-2 signaling, sirolimus and everolimus, and B-cell depletion or decreased signaling, uh, depletion with rituximab or depletion with ionalumab or other uh, uh, agents that are anti-BAF. So we have a little constraint on what we actually choose to do empirically. We have to stop choosing 
empirically, however, and focus on ultimately getting randomized controlled trials that tell us what we should do, which comes from the sentence that we published uh, in, uh, to a uh, paragraph to, to emphasize that, that we really have this urgent unmet need for appropriately powered randomized controlled trials, and they're imperative to improve our therapeutic options for our patients uh, in the future. So one of my pleas uh, is that uh, everyone uh, looking at a potential patient needing alternative therapy, uh, the seek uh, evidence of uh, whether there's access for that patient to consider enrollment in a clinical trial. Now, what has been the focus of the clinical trial development? It has been in the anti-B cell arena. You see to the left a mouse model of autoimmune hepatitis, and they used anti-CD20 rituximab, and in the mouse, you see dense inflammation in the top left panel and virtually no inflammation in the treated mouse. They had subset analyses of the cells. And it wasn't just that the B cells went away, but the T cells did too. Now to the right is the uh, 10 original uh, published cases. Uh, there are uh, more, and I'm going to uh, show those to you in just a, a moment. And this is looking what happened to their ALTs. And so you can see that many of them went substantially below one, the upper limit of normal, and others came to the upper limit of normal. And these were all the highly selected patients who were intolerant or non-responsive. Now, the mechanism still remains uh, problematic. Um, shown in blue, this the, uh, concept of an antibody-mediated cytotoxicity uh, remains uh, relatively unproven. Uh, in uh, human autoimmune hepatitis. And therefore our focus is that when we get rid of B cells, we really uh, to, uh, have the effect uh, to uh, change T helper and cytotoxic effector cells uh, from uh, the lymphocyte uh, pool. Now the larger study that I was speaking about is uh, one that looks in a retrospective manner uh, at 22 patients from UK, Canada, and Germany. They looked at what they had taken prior to being placed on rituximab, again, empirically placed on it, no real uh, rigorous inclusion criteria. And then they looked at the outcomes. So first of the top panel, you see that these patients uh, had many different treatments before they went on rituximab. You can see the prednisone, the MMF, azathioprine, dicrolimus, cyclosporin, budesonide, sirolimus. You can see in the middle panel, sort of the, the different uh, patient numbers and everybody was on prednisone. Many were, had been on azathioprine, some were on MMF while on azathioprine, which is really something you shouldn't do because that's, that's too much anti-proliferation. You see the tacrolimus, the cyclosporin, et cetera. Uh, then you start to see the outcomes of the issues that are on the bottom panels. And that is after rituximab, and you see it's uh, up through uh, 24 months of data, you had these striking uh, decreases in the, the patients followed that long. So it's obviously it's a, it's a smaller number than the total of patients. In uh, AST, in the panel left, next to it is ALT. Then you see albumin rising, you see bilirubin remaining uh, normal, and you see a drop in IgG. So all that we were seeking was achieved uh, with, in this case, rituximab, but again, it's anecdotal because of the high selection of the patients that were uh, treated. That brings us to the only uh, randomized clinical uh, trial that has been conducted uh, in this space, and it's an ongoing trial. Uh, and it's for patients failing to achieve remission due to intolerance or inadequate response to steroids and an antiproliferative. That antiproliferative could be azathioprine, it could be 6MP, or it could be MMF. If you failed any of those, the patient would be theoretically uh, eligible. You'll also note on the left bottom that the design includes a crossover at 24 weeks, which is the point of the initial liver biopsy, so that the placebo patients are going to be treated, which is important for our patients because they want to know what's in it for them. And so no one is ultimately uh, going to not have access to the investigational product. Now, the primary objective of this study is normalization of ALT at week 24. The secondary objectives 
are the relationship of the iodalumab and the ALT normalization. And then the key exploratory objectives include histologic changes and uh, the PKPD and whether the, uh, there's an immune response to the monoclonal uh, antibody, which is a humanized uh, antibody against BATH. Now, B cell activating factor or BATH is something that floats around in the circulation in high concentrations in autoimmune hepatitis patients. So one effect of the antibody is to bind it and remove it as a ligand to stimulate BATH receptors on B cells. The other is that the anti-BATH shares similarities with the binding sites for BATH receptors and it, it attacks receptors and kills the B cell through antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So it depletes the B cells and it takes away their signaling. And it's much longer lived than is an anti-CD20 depletion of B cells. It is uh, as a entity anti-BATH, FDA approved for the treatment of lupus in, in the uh, compound uh, produced by GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, and it's under study uh, by Novartis, not only in this randomized controlled trial, but for other autoimmune diseases. Well, when all else fails, we have transplantation. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. The indications are those of all patients undergoing liver transplantation for a, a, a hepatitic a disease. The outcomes tend to be excellent uh, in uh, the patients with uh, autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, these are somewhat old data now, but they came from the 27,000 adult uh, transplanted in the UNOS database. We do have the issue of recurrence, however. Uh, the uh, features of recurrence and the differential diagnosis uh, always have to be entertained, and they're illustrated for you on the left. But I'll call attention to our systematic review and meta-analysis that asks the question, of, is the risk of recurrence unaffected by continuation or discontinuation of steroids? And you can see the data for yourself here. Still very few studies were published that allowed us to actually do a meta-analysis. But when you did, it does not appear that patients have any more risk of uh, recurrent autoimmune hepatitis when they're withdrawn from uh, steroids post-transplant than those that continue steroids. And finally, what is the uh, issue of recurrence and its relationship to allograft loss? And you can see uh, several different diseases uh, here. AIH, I put the line on, about a 10% allograft loss after uh, 13 years, uh, which uh, is uh, quite outstanding. And uh, it's uh, therefore deemed to have an excellent uh, prognosis. So let me summarize. Therapeutic remission in autoimmune hepatitis is defined by sustained normalization of ALT as the, as the primary event. It also is subsequently uh, results in the biochemical normalization of IgG. When it's achieved, it reduces the risk of progression, liver-related death, the need for uh, orthotopic liver transplantation. That's why we have it as a recommendation. It occurs in about 60% now using standard of care immunosuppression with steroids with or without, uh, with a uh, thiopurine. Second line therapies must systematically, uh, 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 require systematic assessment of the causes of the lack of response and hence the multiple questions that I posed uh, for us in this talk. And there's poor quality evidence conditionally supporting initial use of MMF over tacrolimus as the first line choice for the need of such non-responsive or partially responding patients. There's clearly an urgent and unmet need for randomized controlled trials of therapeutics in AIH. And we therefore have to identify the 40% or so of patients who are non-responsive to or intolerant of standard of care immunosuppression and, and refer them to the currently ongoing trial, if at all possible, and to future trials. Uh, and I think that as gastroenterologists and hepatologists, everyone on this call needs to feel a certain personal responsibility for uh, uh, 
support of these randomized controlled trials because industry uh, is unfortunately a business. And if they don't see that there is enrollment, they are going to interpret it is that there's no significant unmet need to be addressed and they're not going to support trials. I think every one of us that treats a large number of autoimmune hepatitis patients knows that we would benefit by having uh, uh, evidence basis of better therapeutic options for such patients. So we either do the trials or we're never going to do any trials because no one in industry is going to recognize that there's a, this unmet need. OLT is an excellent option for liver failure or hepatocellular carcinoma uh, in uh, cirrhotic patients, uh, despite its recurrence in 22%. Um, it it uh, is independent of whether you did or did not withdraw steroids post OLT, and I've shown you it has little allograft impact. So with that said, I want to thank you very much for your attention and would like to uh, open it up for any questions that you might have. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak this morning.